Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard, author of Visualizing Happiness in Every Area of Your Life. And I'm a host of this podcast, Incredible Life Creator. And today my guest is Miss Camille Martin. Hi, nice to nice to meet you and nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, happy to have you. And you are a fellow Southerner, so we love that about you. Yes. <laughs> uh, but let me just read your bio so people know who you are. Sure. So, uh, Camille Martin is a registered dietitian, health blogger, and senior technical editor for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She is also a former chronic dieter who wasted nearly 25 years of her life on a diet. In her book, Love to Lose, Love Your Life and Watch the Weight Lose Itself, she uses what she learned on her own weight loss journey to help other women stop wasting their lives on a diet, embrace everything about themselves, achieve what they're truly capable of, and lose weight in the process. She received a Bachelor of Arts in English from the University of Georgia and a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition from Georgia State University. She is a vegetarian, marathon runner, and proud mother of two daughters and three rescue dogs. All right. So I'd love <laughs> to hear your story. Yeah. See where you started out and how you got to be doing what you're doing now. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, I started, my focus is to help women lose weight without dieting, but even more than that, to help them start working toward their full potential. And in that um, pursuit of passion and excitement and joy of setting a larger goal for themselves rather than dieting, you end up transforming how you feel on, your, on the inside, which helps you naturally make better choices. So how I got into all of that was that I was a chronic dieter. I started dieting when I was about 12 years old and um, was an emotional eater and basically spent the next 25 years of my life uh, crash dieting, binge eating. Um, I had an eating disorder and just a lot of craziness that really... Um, at a certain point after about 25 years, I'm surprised it took me that long, but I finally just reached a breaking point with it and just said, you know, I just can't, I can't keep doing this to myself. So I quit dieting and rather than gain a bunch of weight, the opposite happened. And it was because I had released so much resistance in my life toward my body and toward, um, I mean, yeah, just the willpower and the resistance that's required and generated by dieting so often. When all of that went away, my habits started to change on their own. And not coincidentally, I because I took an interest in my health rather than trying to just get rid of weight, I started reading about nutrition and health and about my body. And then I decided to um, take a class at night after uh, after work in downtown Atlanta, Georgia State University, I would go after work and take a nutrition class. And then I just kept going and I got really excited about it. And it was really in setting and working toward achieving that goal that everything really came together for me. Um, I, was, I was working in a hotel as a meeting planner and I quit that job and I completely pivoted as you and I talked about before we started um, into a whole new career. So it's just been life-changing and it was, it was really by accident, but I don't think there really are any accidents in life. It was all meant to be. <laughs> exactly. So when you first started out, when you first came out of school, what were you doing for a career? Um, when I first started out, I worked at Turner Broadcasting in the marketing department um, and then gosh, I had so many different jobs. I really wanted to just find that one thing that I would be really good at, that I would be passionate about. So I had a series of sort of just like, um, totally not related industries on my resume. And I felt actually at the time, like I felt very self-conscious about that, that like I was switching, 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 and people were like, what are you doing now? But my mission was to find that one thing that I was good at. And I ended up finding it, but I like to tell younger people, like when they're obsessing about what should I do? What should I be? You can be so many different things. You don't have to just pick one thing. I mean, unless you're a doctor, unless you are pursuing something that is, um, 
very linear. You, you go to medical school and then you become a doctor. That's very different. But if you don't know what you want to do, it's okay. Cause yeah, change is, it's good. It's people will tell you, especially people, my parents age will say, you know, you need to just find one thing and stick with it. But I don't agree with that actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And have you found that the different skills you've learned in these various modalities, has that helped you with what you're doing now? Yeah. Um, let's see. And I think um, most of all, what's helped me in all of those different jobs is having to start over and having to, um, you know, learn a new skill or face a fear or meet all new people that's a great set of skills to just, you know, for life, like just to face fears and start over and not be afraid to keep trying. But, um, but yeah, in terms of like specific career skills, um, they were all pretty different. Let's see. I was a hotel meeting planner. I was an executive assistant for an architect at an architectural firm. I lived in France for a year and worked at a hotel, which was wonderful, but but yeah, starting something new requires you to step out of your comfort zone. So that's been one of the best things that I've learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is so important because many people are afraid to make those changes. Even when they're unhappy, they're afraid to step out and try something new. Yeah. I know a lot of people who are, you know, miserable in their jobs and it's easier said than done. Like, you know, life's too short. You don't have to do something you hate because it feels very much like you're tied to it, you know, financially or for health insurance, or I'm too old to make a switch. You're never too old. That is something that I want people to know is that I switched careers when I was, you know, I think I was 33, 34, maybe, mm -hmm. um, and became a dietitian. And actually I have to say my my career, I am a dietitian and I do help women and I have my side business, but my career now and for 19 years has been to be a technical writer and an editor at the CDC, which is, I mean, not necessarily connected to me teaching women, you know, how to lose weight without dieting or um, being an actual dietitian. I have medical knowledge and uh, public health knowledge, which is why I got hired, but um and I have an English degree from way back when. So see, you never know. They Things do match up. They actually picked my resume out of a pile because I had an English degree and a nutrition degree. Mm -hmm. And they wanted someone with both. And I was the only one, I think, that had both. But, um, but yeah, you're never too old to make a change. And you never know how the universe will align to set up you know, lots of different elements to give you just your perfect place in the world. Exactly. And for listeners who aren't aware, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, that is one of the hardest places to get in for any <laughs> type of job. They, they have people lined up wanting to work at the CDC and just hoping they get a chance. Oh, well, it yeah, it wasn't easy to get in. I mean, it's not, you can't know somebody who's going to get you an interview. It's all like, you know, you are thrown in the hat with everybody, but it's a wonderful place to work. And you know how I got in there actually is that um, I decided while I was in school that I'd always had a fascination with the CDC and I thought, well, I wonder if they have internships. And, you know, I'm 33 and I'm thinking, you know, well, if they do, it's going to be for people who have a PhD from Harvard. But I applied anyway, and I ended up getting this internship to be a proofreader at this new journal. And so when I graduated and got my um, my dietetics license, they offered me a job. So it, it really, to me, it's like, even if if someone had told me that I would have this job, I would have never had the courage. I would have said, there's no way that I would get a job there because I don't have this or that or whatever. And you just take one tiny step and take one chance. I sent the resume in, I filled out the application and they said, if you don't hear back from us in six six months, I think, um, sorry. And I didn't hear back and I thought, oh, well, um, 
And then I got a call eight months at, later, not six months. And, you know, can you come down? We just wanted to meet you. Things like, don't be afraid to try just because it seems impossible. That's a, that's a huge life lesson. I think that is a huge life lesson. And even as a young person, you know, you actually had the confidence to go from job to job. Um, and there are a lot of people who don't have that confidence. So were there things that you told yourself certain, I don't know, practices you had something that you did that would give you that confidence when you needed it? Oh gosh, I had no confidence. I, <laughs> I actually <laughs> was so self-conscious that I was changing careers. I think what I always had though, was this feeling, this like, I just, some, something was always pushing me to find the thing that I was good at. And I have to say, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. None of my friends, you know, people got a degree. I was taught by my family and my upbringing, you get a college degree, whatever, but then you go get married and you have kids and you're a homemaker. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But none of my friends were even really working. No, none of them had a job. They were getting married or they worked at a you know, a dress shop or their dad's place or something. And that's totally fine. But like, I always thought there was something really wrong with me. Like why my family was like, why are you doing that? Like, who cares if you, you have a job at Turner Broadcasting, that's great. You're an assistant, stay there and then get married. And I don't know, for whatever reason, it wasn't that I was so ultra confident because that is opposite of how I felt. I just felt this desire and drive to find the thing that I was good at and that would be my passion. So I was always just looking for that. And it was a stumbling blocks path the whole way. And I would say that it was all the way up until I was even, you know, 50 years old, I'm about to be 53, that I went through a divorce. I mean, life's always going to throw these things at you, but you just have to have that know inside of you that you can, if you listen to the voice that's always talking to you, not your inner critic, your soul. Mm -hmm. I had so many times in my life when my soul was speaking to me and sometimes I listened, but sometimes I ignored that. And mm -hmm. now I see if you, just be true to yourself, it sounds cliche, but try to tune in to what your inner wisdom is telling you and always, always follow your gut feeling. Yeah, that's so important. Mm -hmm. It really is. So there's so many products, services, philosophies, diets around <laughs> losing weight. I mean, oh, it's yeah. a multi-billion, trillion, who knows how much. Right. And, you know, I, I've been one of those people that I've, you know, I've tried them all. I've been on paleo. I've been in keto you know, I've been vegan, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. you know, uh, there's just so much out there. So there's a lot of information coming at people. And then mm -hmm. there's the emotional piece where, you know, a lot of us will hold on to weight um, because of whatever we're connecting things with, or we eat for yeah. certain reasons, emotional reasons. Yes. I mean, there's so much out there. And so, my question to you is, how is it that you're helping people? What is the mindset you're working with? Well, first of all, diets don't work, but not because of each individual diet being different. They look different, but on the surface, they look different. But underneath, they all have the same basic structure, which is eliminate, cut out, um, and, you know, they're one size fits all. It's all about making a ton of huge changes all at the same time to what you normally do. Um, and they don't work because you're not learning how to change your habits, which is really the only thing that does work. And if you're an emotional eater, like I was, when you go on a diet and you restrict yourself or you try to change everything that you're doing all at once, that creates tremendous resistance. And then what you do is you're, you are programmed subconsciously or biologically or whatever to relieve that resistance and to neutralize it. And so if you are 
an emotional eater, what you're going to go do is eat something to make yourself feel better. And I mean, we've all experienced that, right? Like I'm going on this diet. This is going to be the one I'm going to just buckle down and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do everything right. And then your life takes over and something goes wrong. You know, your kids were late to school or whatever stress. And then the stress of the diet and the resistance that has built up with all that willpower you have to use, you, you know, grab three cookies, you scarf them down, and then you feel like a total failure and you give up and you quit. And then you assume that it was you, but it's not you. It's not about willpower. It's about um, deciding that you're going to go back. If you have a problem like with emotional eating, I'm not talking about people who have, you know, a medical weight problem. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people like me who spent years and years and years trying to diet off the same amount of weight, like the same 10 pounds. Um, I had an issue with, it was not about the food I was eating. It was about the way I was eating the food. And so you have to get go back in time and start drop all of the shame that you feel about the way you're using food. And you have to just sort of being an, an investigator and look at what, how you were raised. When did you start using food to make yourself feel better? And once you can get to the bottom of that, you can understand yourself and stop feeling like ashamed and feeling like a failure and then you just take one baby step forward, trying to change your habits, which is what I help people do, changing habits little by little, change the way you think about food, change the way you think about yourself and the destructive thoughts that you're having that are pushing you to take the wrong actions. So it's a whole network of things, but you have to, you have to give yourself time. And really, I always just say there is no time limit. It's your whole life. You're always a work in progress. But um, diets are one size fits all. What works for me on a diet wouldn't work for you or your sister or my mother. And um, you don't learn anything. That's why they're all the same. And that's why none of them work. So that makes sense. And, you know, and then there's, um, I know I have certain sensitivities, so I don't eat wheat or yeah, dairy or um, corn, you know, there's certain things that people have sensitivities to. And I think Definitely. that adds into it too, because if you don't sure. realize you have the sensitivities or sometimes you just like, I just want that cookie. <laughs> yeah. And, you know? and I'm not and supposed to have, have that <laughs> sugar or whatever, <laughs> but you know, it's, you know, there's so many things that can affect how we feel. Totally. Um, and the foods you eat have a tremendous effect on how you feel. So when I say it's not about the food, of course, it's about the food. But like what I want, what happens is that we get hyper focused on food only without investigating any of the psychological or emotional things that are going on behind the scenes. And when you do both at the same time, that's when the magic happens is that when you, because when you start changing how you think and start really investigating, that gives you a feeling of confidence, like you're taking control. And then that feeling decreases that feeling of I'm out of control and I'm just going to grab something to eat, or I just need a piece of pizza. You know what I mean? And then the less of those foods you eat, the better you feel and the more clear headed you are to think better. So it all works hand in hand, but it just makes me sad to see women who don't realize that it's not them. It's the diet. Diets just don't work. And they're not, they're shaming themselves and then failing over and over. And that just, it puts your self-confidence, you know, in the toilet. And that's the problem. That's where, to me, we have to start and then start figuring out the food as you go, but don't make it all about the food and nothing about that part. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then a lot of times food is also connected to our social interactions, our yeah. connections. So, you, you know, when you're growing up, what did we have on our birthday? A birthday cake. Absolutely. You know, when we go out with friends, especially during high school in our younger years, and it, you know, it, we still have that memory. Well, we went, went and had pizza after the game, you know, yeah. all of a yeah. sudden the happy met you want, you still want the happy memories. But there's right. no birthday cake and there's no pizza. <laughs> so how do we fill in the gap there? How do we enjoy those social interactions when everyone else is eating the things that we're not eating? 
Well, I think that's the thing. I mean, if you're not eating those foods because you have a, a biological sensitivity and or an intolerance, that's different. Um, but I can just speak from the side of it where you're you can eat. I I always say you literally can eat whatever you want. You really can. It's just food. You are in control of it. Just because you eat one cookie doesn't mean you have to eat the whole box or there's something to be afraid of that you're going to lose control. You have to get to a place of, you know what, tonight's girl's night out. I'm trying not to eat carbs, but you know what? I mean, I can eat carbs all I want to, or I don't have to. We're making it so like this weighted thing, like we're, it's this like, I don't even know how to put it, but like, it's the biggest deal ever. It is not a big deal. If you were trying to cut carbs out of your diet, you know, for a little while, or if you're trying to decrease the amount of carbs and then you go out and it's someone's birthday and they have birthday cake and you have a slice, you're not a failure. You haven't completely, you know, like it's not over. Like you can still pick yourself back up tomorrow and keep going. But like, why are you eliminating carbs? Are you doing it because you want to see if you're, if you feel better without them? That's great. Are you doing it to cut calories or because a diet told you that you're not allowed to eat carbs? That's where the issue is. You know what I mean? Like you have complete control. Food has no power over you and you can eat it or you cannot eat it. It's not a big deal, but we're making it this loaded thing mm -hmm. where we feel we're ramping up this feeling of like, I'm out of control around food and nothing can be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. And talk about just the, the, the dieting, that dieting cycle and then self image, because I think every uh, I can only speak for women, but every woman has stood in front of the mirror and decided there was some part of her body that was not acceptable or, <laughs> or your whole body. How about your whole, whole body, body is not acceptable. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, I, I remember starting dieting when I was, I don't know, 12, 13, I wasn't yeah. overweight, but I thought I was exactly. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's our culture. It's the media, of course. And we know all of that, but, um, it doesn't take away. I still, even though I'm teaching this and preaching this, I still wake up every morning and I think, you know, oh gosh, you know, what does my stomach look like today? What did I eat last night? And then I have to just say, cut, you know, that's, it's just, that's that old tape that plays in my head because it's been there since I was 12. Um, but yeah, that won't ever leave me. And I know every woman is familiar with that. And it's just, there's no way around it because we're just so inundated with those messages from the um, cultural messages and media messages. And it is starting to change a little bit, but then now you've got social media that's, you know, taking it off in another direction with like filters and all of this stuff. But you just have to determine that you're going to love exactly who you are, where you are right now. And that is so much easier said than done. But the way I accomplish that is when I have those thoughts, which are probably, you know, it's every hour for sure. You know, so second guessing myself, no one feels totally confident. People look like they do, but everyone's scared. Everyone feels insecure. Nobody really knows what they're doing. Um, but what I try to remember is I look back at all of the things that I have come through in my life. And I've, I have had some truly horrendous experiences just like you have. And no one's bad experiences is, is more painful than someone else's. If you've experienced pain and you've come through on the other side of it, I don't care if you were bullied as a child or you lost a loved one or, you know, your pet died, whatever it is, it's pain to you. So look back on where you have come from and the things that you have overcome and all of the progress that you've made as a, as a woman, a person, um, and really try to just let that sink into your soul that what you look like right now, if you're not happy with what you look like, try to see that the things that you're not happy about, you're living in a body that has brought you here today. 
And just that's really the only thing that I do that helps me is to say, you know what, I, you know, I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh my God, you know, if I just went like this and I went to, (laughs) (laughs) we all do those different things. If I just stand a little taller, (laughs) if I just had $12,000, I could just get this fixed. But, you know, um, it's just, I, I'm living in this body. I had two beautiful children. You know, my stomach isn't flat. I don't have six pack abs. My arms look a little different than they used to, but you know what? I, I really, truly don't care. I'm just so happy to be at this stage in my life. And I have to tell you, Kimberly, that one of the things that I teach people that I work with is that the best way to get past all of that negativity and that, you know, the feeling of worthlessness is to set a goal, to set a big goal for your life. And even if your big goal right now is, I want to run a 5k or I want to take a trip or I want to go somewhere alone. I've never done, you know, taking a trip alone or with whatever, Mm -hmm. set a big goal that has nothing to do with what you look like and break it down into baby steps, like at least 20, even like the teeniest, tiniest, most obvious steps that you could take, but write them down and start taking them one right after the other, check it off your list and just feel that sense of confidence that you're taking action. And so that's what, when you can start feeling that feeling of like, Hey, you know what? I can do this. I can do things I didn't think that I could do. And Mm -hmm. You just have no idea where you will end up. If you had told me I was going to end up podcasting and like being interviewed, I would have been like, what? I mean, what am I going to talk about? But like, who knows? Now I'm in a place I never imagined myself to be. So I wish women would just say, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm just going to set a goal and start working on achieving it and watch your whole life change. It really will. Yeah. And I mean, what you're talking about is just having a purpose and We might have more than one purpose in life, but having something that you're looking forward to, because even in in weight gain or losing weight or anything, we always want to, we always go away from pain. So if we can, as soon as we're far far enough from the pain, then we can start eating again or whatever. So if you have something you're going towards instead, so like you said, you're not concentrating on what you're eating so much yeah. I mean I, I know thinking about food all the time you can just get overwhelmed with that's all I have to that my whole life is this food yeah. thing you know but, <laughs> but if you don't have to sit there and just think about the food you're eating yes. and you can be looking at something else that you're excited about exactly and when you're busy working toward that you're you're too busy you're too excited like it's highly, it used to be highly appealing to me. And I, honestly, on some days it still is to be like, I'm so exhausted. I'm so not happy today. I don't like what happened. I'm, you know, to sit down in front of Netflix and open up some ice cream and just sit there. I mean, that's how, what I train myself to do. So I have to, I know how to manage it now, but like when you're excited about something in your life, you're, you're not unhappy. You don't need to fill yourself up that way. Um, and also like, yeah, finding that purpose and that passion, it automatically naturally will change your habits. You will start choosing different foods. Um, it just, it's a process that happens and I don't know exactly why it works, but that's what happened to me. I went from drinking diet, Dr. Pepper all day long at work, no water. We didn't used to drink water. I don't know where, (laughs) I don't know when that (laughs) happened, but I drank diet Dr. Pepper and I would come home and eat a lean cuisine and then like try to get on my treadmill and run. And it's like, once I started like getting an interest in health and like, maybe I'll just learn about it. Things just opened up, you know? And so your habits will change on their own. You'll start to be crave different foods. You'll start like, I'm too, you know, I can't go out tonight and drink three glasses of wine and eat chips and cheese dip because I got to get up tomorrow and I'm going to be on a podcast and I got to be fresh. So those kinds of things just naturally help change, switch things around, but start with a small goal. You don't have to go climb Mount Everest. I mean, in fact, don't start with something. I would like to say it's a combination between 
something you dreamed about when you were a little girl Mm -hmm. and something that is not so far out of the realm. Like, you know, if you wanted, wanted to be an astronaut, that's amazing, but maybe you could take a piece of that and put it into uh, your life now that like would be doable, but also inspiring. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, that makes total sense. Cause I know uh, once my kids were older, I said, okay, what is it that I want to do? And I've always liked art. So I started taking art classes about five, six years ago. Awesome. And that, you know, that is something that I look forward to. And it's yes. something I can do whenever I have time or when I, you know, want to. And it fulfills me. And it's yeah. just that little, little thing. So it doesn't, That's like amazing. you said, it doesn't have to be a big thing. No. And yeah. Uh, did you paint that, the the um, background that you've got? No, or not this one. That's just the background. Uh-huh. <laughs> Very yeah just a um, <laughs> but yeah it does being getting that nurturing creative space also is a great way to do it I just I'm reading a book right now it's called find your unicorn space have you heard of that no but it sounds great <laughs> it's really good um I think the name the author's name is Eve Rodsky I heard about it from Reese Witherspoon's book club but um so for anyone who's listening if you're looking to find that uh, an activity that, you know, makes you feel creatively fulfilled. And um, there's more to it than that. It's like, she's saying that creativity is not an option. Like we all need that. So it's a really good book. I recommend it. <laughs> Great. So I was wondering, is there anything you do every day? Like that some people have a morning routine. Is there anything you do every day that just sets you for the day to center yeah. you, get you ready? Definitely. I get up. I'm an extreme morning person. Um, so I get up at about four. I have to get up to, I have to have that time where I have my coffee and light my candle and read something inspiring. Truly that is, I just posted about this on um, Instagram. That is like one of my biggest weight loss, not weight loss, but like health tips is to get up earlier than normal and have some time to yourself to center yourself for your day. Um, I used to get up and just watch the Today Show. I That would be unthinkable to me now because it would put me in the wrong space um, mm-hmm. watching news and things that are destructive. And, you know, you can keep up without doing that. But the mm-hmm. the morning time I find is like that when you're in the dark and it's peaceful and you're just alone with your thoughts you will, if you start listening, I mean, I actually just sit there and go, okay, universe, I give me my instructions for the day. What, what's today about, what do I need to focus on? And you'll just be amazed at the, at what you hear if you tune in, but that's what I do every morning. I cannot roll out of the bed and start my day, or I would be, it would be a disaster. And some days it's a disaster anyways, but I know for sure, if I don't have that time that it would be. Makes sense. So how do you work with people? Do you have an office where you work or you're working online? No, I'm online. My business is online only. And I used to work, do private coaching, but I just don't do that anymore. I just, um, I've gotten so busy where I don't have the time to do that, but I'm very active on Instagram and um, I'm, I write a blog every week and I film videos. I have a YouTube channel. So if anybody wants to go head over to my website, you can find any of those things and access my, my content that way, but I'm always available to answer questions. So if anyone ever wants to email me and ask me questions, I'm totally here to answer anything and help anybody the, any way they need. Mm-hmm. And what is your website and how do people find you on social media? Sure. My website is Camille Martin, and that's C-A-M-I-L-L-E, Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N, and then R-D for registered dietitian.com. And then um, all of my social media handles are at the bottom of the page. Okay, great. Yeah, I have those. Those will be in the show notes. So okay. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, any um, else you wanted to share about how... Yeah. yeah, you know, the what I always like to leave women with, and I'm sure men are listening to, but especially for the women who feel, you know, demoralized or like, you know, is it too late for me or sort of like you've lost yourself? I just have one 
one thing that you need to do. It's what I just said, pick a goal, go sit outside somewhere when it's a pretty day, get a journal out and just let your mind wander and think of something that really used to bring you joy. Like what you were saying about painting or traveling or music or business. If you wanted to be, you know, in business somehow and write down lots of different ideas of things like don't censor yourself and then pick one that feels like it most resonates with you. And then take another sheet of paper, write that goal at the top, and list. Um, so for example, if you wanted to learn to speak a foreign language, I mean, you could write at the top of the list, go to Barnes and Noble and buy a book. Like that's so easy, but it's the easier, the better. And then just start checking them off and just watch your whole life transform. That's what I want people to walk away with. And you are not your body. We are all powerful. We don't even know. We haven't even gotten a glimpse of what we are actually capable of. So never give up. Everyone's scared. Everyone's afraid. And you can do it. If I can do what I've done, then anybody can. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. So now I have a personal question. What gives okay. you the most happiness and fulfillment in your life at this point? Well, definitely my daughters um, and hanging out with them and laughing and having fun. Um, just connecting with people. We did, I have to say, just adopt a rescue, um, a men pin. Do you know what kind of dogs those are? It's like a Doberman Pinscher, but they're just like this big. And they're little. <laughs> so little. And her name is Jessie and she's just so much fun. But, um, but yeah, my baby girls and then my dogs and yeah, I have a boyfriend who I love dearly and we're super happy. So it's my connections with people and animals. Yeah, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today and for sharing all your wisdom. Well, I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me, Kimberly. Yeah. So I have one last question. Oh, what okay. is your best advice on living an incredible, amazing life? Trust your gut. Whenever your gut is telling you something, your head might be saying, no, that's not true. But however you feel, you're right. And you need to tune into that. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Camille. Thank you, Kimberly. We'll talk to you again soon. Okay.